Um, I know it's three o'clock on, so I'm hoping that everybody's got their caffeine here. We'll try not to put you all to sleep here, but um, yeah, my name is Rhett Sangster. I work at the Office of the Treaty Commissioner and uh, happy to be here with you. Um, I'm here, I'm joined by my, my friend Justice Noon and uh, just to, by way of introduction, yeah, so my name is Rhett. I've, I grew up in Treaty 6 territory. I'm a fourth generation settler. My ancestors uh, came from Europe and sort of just before and just after the First World War and settled in Southeast Saskatchewan in Treaty 2 and Treaty 4. Um, and I've uh, I moved away uh, and have but been, have been back in Saskatchewan since almost 10 years now, and since 2014, and have been working at the Office of the Treaty Commissioner. I have a background in diplomacy, and I sort of still see myself as a bit of a diplomat trying to use uh, whatever skills I have to try to um, bring people together and have some, some of those tough discussions that we need to have. Justice. Hey guys, my name is Justice Noon. Sorry, this is like really tall. Okay, so I'll try to, just kidding. <laughs> Hi, my name is <laughs> Justice Noon and I was born and raised here in Saskatoon. Um, but under uh, treaty, I'm from Thunderchild First Nations. I'm currently a second year environmental science student at the U of S at the College of Agriculture. But currently I am serving as the interim president of the Indigenous Student Union. And uh, yeah, just kind of really passionate about um, different kinds of works that, you know, talks about uh, two world seeing. So um, yeah, I'll hand that over back to you, Rhett. So just by way of an overview, we're gonna talk to you a little bit about a framework that we've been working on for the last, uh, well, a long time, um, to develop a framework to create action plans and measure progress on truth and reconciliation. Um, We've looked at uh, the calls to action, the calls to justice, uh, UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, these foundational documents and created a, a way that we can um, measure progress on those things. We think it's pretty grassroots led. We've heard a lot about community, linking community and research. Uh, humbly, we think we've been trying to do that. And um, so we wanna tell you a bit about it. We also were, were benef benefited from some funding from, um, from the NIR, and, uh, and so uh, Justice is going to talk about the work that she did through that funding as well. So um, truth and reconciliation, treaty implementation, these are pretty big words, and um, what do they actually mean? Um, we went out, uh, we've got a strategy at the OTC where we sort of um, have three things that we're trying to do. The first one was to say, well, what is success? Um, so we went out to community, um, hundreds, thousands of people across Saskatchewan, as wide a variety of people as we could get, Indigenous, non-Indigenous, First Nation, Métis, uh, newcomers, um, and we asked, um, we do this little exercise, fireside exercise, where we say, close your eyes, imagine yourself 25 years from now, and you're telling stories around the campfire to a young person about how you're proud of the change that has happened in, in 25 years from now. Uh, what are the stories you're telling? So we went out and we did that to many, many people and asked those stories and gathered those stories and created a vision of success from that. Um, we were also doing a lot of work to try to connect the right people. So. Our theory is that you know treaty was meant to be about sharing this territory and mutual benefit, uh, the spirit and intent that was that was entered into with the pipe. Unfortunately, the Indian Act came upon us and uh, separated us, and so we don't know each other very well. We don't understand each other very well. So we're trying to use the OTC's um, good offices to create some space where community leaders in Battleford or Yorkton or Prince Albert or Regina or Saskatoon can come together. Um, learn from each other, unlearn from each other, build some relationships and some trust, hopefully. So we've been doing that. And then third uh, strategy is to say, how will we measure progress? If we have this vision and we have these right people working on it, how do we know if we're getting there? So this is our vision. Um, and it has four elements. It says that if we uh, want to make progress on treaty implementation, we have to, number one, understand our history. We have to connect with the ancestors of this territory. Uh, we need to know our own treaty story of how we came to be here or how we've, we've always been here. Um, we need to know the wrongs that have happened and the continuing to happen so that we can, so we can move forward. 
Um, the second, as we move to the east on the, on the medicine wheel here, we, um, we've heard that we need to start with our cultures and our worldviews. So as the sun rises in the east, uh, we start with culture, we start with prayer, we start with ceremony, uh, we start with knowing who we are. Uh, and creating spaces for indigenous and non-indigenous culture and worldview to share space, which I think is what we're doing here today. Um, third, as we move to the south, it's about systems. Uh, people have told us that we need to remake our systems. We need to look at the education system, the political system, the, um, the various systems, the justice system, and remake those. Uh, and then third, as we move to the west, this is the fall time that we're in now, uh, when we come upon foul suppers and harvest, it's about relationship building and true, authentic partnerships and trust. And how do we build that? How do we work? So that's I understand that those are big, big issues and those are, we're not there yet, but that is what Saskatchewan people have told us, that if we can work on those four things, that that can, move, that can uh, equate to truth and reconciliation. Here's just some pictures of the, the, the community work that we've been doing, and uh, again, I know that there's been a lot of theme today about connecting research to community. We have uh, 12 reconciliation circles that we've been working with across the province. These are people, um, Indigenous, non-Indigenous, uh, Métis First Nation, that are, that are working to try to do reconciliation in their community. And often they're doing it a little bit blindly. They don't know exactly what they're doing, that they're trying and they're making mistakes and they're doing it together. Um, and what I would love to see us do is to study that and say, what's working? What's not working? How do we, how do we better use our energy, our limited resources that we have to progress, make some progress on that? Uh, the third strategy we did was on measuring progress. So we um, started off, uh, actually, many of you would know, Michael Heimlich and Annie Batiste uh, came on with us for, a, started off as a three-month contract to build us an evaluation framework. And I think three and a half years later, we're still working on it. Um, but it was, they started by going through line by line, the calls to action, the calls to justice, UNDRIP, and saying, how would you measure call to action 92? Um, what are the indicators that would, that would lead to that? And then they took all of those, they literally cut them all up into small little pieces and grouped them all together on the wall and ripped half the paint off the commissioner's office wall and then uh, came up with this crazy looking logic model. And usually I always joke that there's usually a few of you are that are getting really excited about this logic model right now and there are a few of you that are dying inside. Uh, <laughs> um, and yeah, I maybe sit, fit somewhere in the middle. But, I'd show it in this case to show some of the complexity, some of the thinking we've done. We recognize this is a hypothesis. Uh, we probably got some things wrong in here, but this is an attempt to try to uh, make some logical um, assumptions and make some logical uh, thinking on how we can move forward. Um, we also recognize that this is a Western way of looking at things and it's a very linear process and it's, and it's things. And so we've also tried very hard through this process to, um, to look for metaphors, to look for simile, to, to take this to ceremony, to talk to uh, knowledge keepers and elders and, and, and try to bring language into it as much as we can. We have translated the vision into uh, um, um, Y dialect Cree as well as um, um, Soto and Machif so far, but we're working on getting that to all of them. Um, so this is the growth model. This is um, that crazy logic model, hopefully a little bit more understandable and a bit more uh, understanding. And so um, this is something we've been using now with organizations to go in and map their progress on reconciliation. So five organizations so far um, and some influential ones. The Law Society of Saskatchewan, which is the organization that regulates all the lawyers in Saskatchewan. The Saskatoon Police Service, Sask Culture. Uh, we're just starting with Federated Co-op. Um, with the Sask Saskatchewan Prevention Institute. So there's some, some influential organizations that are using this model to say, where are we, what have we done, uh, and where do we need to go, and how do we measure progress? So I won't get too much into this. I'm happy to talk your ear off about this growth model, but essentially it looks at, on the left-hand side, what is the capacity we need to, need to know? What are the, and again, using the metaphor, what are the seeds? These are the seeds that we have to, to grow um, our understanding of treaty, our understanding of anti-racism, our understanding of uh, who we are and, and privilege, those kinds of things, that hopefully once we plant those seeds will lead to behavioral outcomes. So the middle, middle two sets of outcomes 
uh, where we still hire, start to hire indigenous people. We create spaces in our workplaces where indigenous people feel safe. Uh, our policies change. Um, we build strong relationships, those kinds of things. And then as those seeds grow to trees and we start doing things differently, hopefully the poplar and the spruce and the birch work together into an ecosystem and we start to live differently in our forest of reconciliation where we, you know, uh, include indigenous language is in our in our everyday lives we have indigenous um, sovereign sustainable systems that are working with mainstream systems in a relationship that are that is that is hopefully uh, working in that relationship of treaty that was meant meant to be uh, back in 1876 these are just some of the groups that we've been working on and so we're excited about this um, and yeah, then I'll, uh, so back it up a little bit. Um, we got some funding back in 2000. It took us a little while to get our act together to, to spend it, uh, but we hired Justice in, in 21 and 22 to, um, to look at health uh, specifically and what were the indicators that we had. And our, our, we really tried to look at as many frameworks as we could in developing this, and one of them that we looked at was the cultural responsiveness framework. Um, that uh, many of you know. And so uh, Justice had a look at sort of how do we get the growth model and this the cultural responsive name framework to, to talk to each other and understand each other. Uh, so I'll pass this to Justice here now. There you go. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, so as Rhett was saying, I was hired with the OTC uh, back in 21 and 22 to take a look at the cultural responsive framework and the growth model and, you know, kind of find like how does one support the other, right? From what I can, uh, from what I concluded, the framework itself is kind of like a, a strategic direction, you know, of how, um, what would, you know, what is reconciliation looking like in the health sector, right? And so uh, I got to know that document. Um, <laughs> and as for the growth model, the growth model itself with the logic model, there is a document of indicators. And I like to call them suggestions, right? Suggestions that kind of support um, the, you know, whatever like document that you're trying to uh, implement for reconciliation, right? And I think go into that a little bit. So what I have here is the cultural responsive framework, right? And it had three strategic directions, right? And from under each strategic direction, it had objectives, right? And under each objective had a list of actions on how to support that objective and the overall vision of the strategic direction. I went in there and I used the growth model to um, support each action. It was very tedious work, but it was very thorough. So what I wanna like show to you guys here. So if you look at strategic direction uh, three, objective one in action C, so you would actually find that right about here. That's where you would locate that in the cultural uh, responsive framework, right? So, oops, going backwards, here we go. Uh, so, the strategic direction itself says, transform in health service delivery to be culturally responsive, right? And the objective itself was to foster education in culturally responsive healthcare, right? And the action that supports that overall uh, objective and strategic direction was move towards embedding culturally appropriate and safe practice as a requirement of health practitioner uh, accreditation. So I, one, of the, um, one of the indicators or suggestions from the growth model itself came from 412.0, uh, and it says, here, actually, I have it right here, uh, number of anti-racist and trauma-informed workshops and programs in Saskatchewan per year over time by geographic, uh, geographic locations by the length of the program, organizations, business, government, schools, youth, etc. And I use that indicator to support that action. That's, um, and the reason for that is because in order for us to have some form of movement towards reconciliation, um, well, I guess informed, you know, I guess the Western side of society really needs that data collected, 
right? But with reconciliation, you know, um, it's kind of like, it's like it's a social science, right? It's qualitative, but it needs to be quantified, right? So these indicators are able to produce that quantifiable data of how much are you doing realistically, right? So this action alone is actually supported by 20 different indicators, right? And so depending on the entity itself, the institution itself that is implementing, or is that, that is using the growth model, you know, for their, you know, their action plan here, um, it, uh, it, it has like a list of suggestions, right? To kind of show, hey, like this is how you can do it and this is how you can collect that data of like where you are in that, you know, in that map, right? So um, anyways, I know it's like a little kind of like a lot and I really tried to simplify it in a way that I would understand if someone was telling me about it. But um, yeah, like I said, it was really tedious work, but at the same time, it was very thorough. And I can see how that those measurements can produce results and be an objective of what kind of actions are we actually implementing in our walk towards reconciliation. So um, yeah, I think that's my bit. Oh, yeah. And while I was doing this work, okay, so these indicators, there is like thousands of indicators that I was going through and I was getting to know. And one of the gaps that I did find with this document alone was the lack of food sovereignty. And I know that was kind of a topic beforehand, right? Food sovereignty. And I just love that. Uh, um, I forgot who was talking about that, but saying like the North is abundant, right? Then, okay, how do we implement food sovereignty? How do we get that knowledge out there, right? We have, you know, we can create indicators for food sovereignty where we can measure how much, you know, workshops are being, you know, implemented in that community, right? Um, but anyways, um, there was like an indicator that talked about like how many, you know, people in the community are, and I'm just paraphrasing here, um, are getting their food from the land, right? That's, that was kind of like a soft like food sovereignty direction for the indicator itself. So I would really like to see indicators that really started to like support and measure food sovereignty and how we're making that process, right? Um, moving forward. So that was one of the, the cr critiques I had for the growth model itself. Um, but, and the thing is I'm an environmental science student. So obviously like that is my area of like, you know, seeing that because I, the, with food sovereignty, I think that's like, you know, reconciliation, you know, to the land, right? And, you know, it could even go into like measuring like soils and whatnot and how healthy the land is, right? Which is part of the growth model, by the way. So anyway, I'll just end it there. Thank you. Thanks, Justice. So yeah, I think Justice is a good, shows us how the growth model can work really well with lots of with other frameworks but also how there's gaps yet and we, we need we, there's more work to do yet and so i just wanted to throw this out there i, I don't know if, whether it's bad karma or not to say that we applied for something that we haven't heard from yet or not but um but we did work with uh, a number of people in this room in fact uh on on a, a shirt grant to and I'm just going to throw it out there because I think the idea is a good one, even if we don't get the funding. Uh, I, I think it's something we should be looking at is studying um, the progress of reconciliation and what's what's working out there right now as we are all working in the communities. Um, what's not working? How do we hold? How do we learn from from what the communities are doing? And how do we hold ourselves accountable? How do we create reports that says we're, you know, the land is not healthy in such and such a place or people are not, you know, and we can work. And so I just want to throw it out there that, um, you know, we'd love to, to, to work with, with all of you. Um, we have 12 community groups that are, that are on the ground that are doing things. Um, and, and you have the research and the, and the, the know-how that way. So there's potential progress and potential cooperation there. That's it. Thank you. Aye, aye, Tansi. Good afternoon. Buenos tardes. Uh, my name is Bob Patrick. I work at the University of Saskatchewan in the Department of Geography and Planning. And um, I'm happy to be a recipient uh, a few years ago now of uh, uh, community partnership uh, funding. It was meant to go to the Yukon, but with COVID, things got mixed up and complicated. So 
Uh, I'm going to take you out to British Columbia. How's that for a treat? Um, I have done uh, plenty of research in Saskatchewan, but uh, in the 10 minute allotment, um, I'm going to just stick to British Columbia here. Uh, is this the clicker forward? Okay. So this is a, a climate adaptation planning with First Nation, uh, a First Nation community, uh, the nation of a Tlaman uh, nation, and I'll just take you there. Uh, if you can imagine Vancouver uh, traveling sort of north and west um, to a, a community of Powell River, and Tlaman nation are um, uh, have uh, treaty and uh, territory uh, that they have um, um, acquired through agreements. Um, you see there. Tlaman lands, but their larger territory uh, is in the red outline there. Um, it's a lovely place to do some research and some community engagement. Um, I live close by in the community of Seychelles, uh, and, uh, and so this is sort of the, the, the terrain on the coast there. Um, they were um, experiencing some significant climate change impacts. Uh, you may have heard of the heat dome, uh, but also traditional foods impacted and their lands impacted. Uh, and so in talking to them, they were very uh, keen to see some action done to prepare them for the climate, uh, the climate impacts. Um, so, and as we know, Indigenous peoples are disproportionately affected by climate change. Uh, the climate change is not just the land, uh, it's not just health, but it's also cultural impacts, uh, not to mention uh, infrastructure and communities. So their interest and, uh, in prep preparedness and adaptation uh, commenced around the year 2020, which coincided around the time of uh, the heat dome that hit the West Coast, temperatures, beach temperatures hitting uh, 50 degrees Celsius. It also happened to happen on the lowest, some of the lowest tides of the year. So entire shellfish, uh, oyster and clam beds were uh, destroyed, uh, uh, which is the traditional foods in uh, many coastal communities. And so we set out to do some working committees back in October of 2020. Uh, it was right in the middle of COVID, so it was awkward at times, but we uh, managed to get through it. Uh, we wanted to know where some of the impacts were most felt and what their vulnerabilities were. Uh, we had a number of uh, working sessions um, and uh, partnerships uh, grew very, very quickly. Uh, various provincial agencies, um, but also Vancouver Island University. We had some a professional biologist, and uh, really key to this was a, a media production, a small media production firm, which uh, documented all of this in video. And I want to show you a video of this in a few minutes. Um, the planning process, sort of a, um, a typical planning process, we, we set out to establish a working committee. Uh, that was very successful, but it, it wasn't the, the sort of working committee that I'm used to working with municipalities. It involved a lot of storytelling and elders, uh, and right away we knew that we were missing a part, uh, an important part, which was youth. So we held uh, Saturday youth sessions, um, and uh, the youth were keen to take up photo voice, which is, uh, I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Uh, observations. They did not want to sit in rooms and talk. Um, they wanted to get on the land and talk there. So we, we, we went with uh, elders, but also their guardians and uh, community members to observe. And then the plan making began um, and uh, story maps. So the conclusion of it all was um, um, after a couple of years was um, a virtual reality video. Uh, the virtual reality is where you put on the headgear and you actually have to sit down because if you don't, you'll start following the fish in the water and you'll fall off your chair uh, or fall down. So you need to be in a chair. Um, the photo voice was really interesting. The youth produced a story map just using their iPhones. Um, and uh, community video, uh, um, video and, and that gathered community views. And uh, a risk assessment report was done. I'm not going to run that by you. I don't have time for that. But about a 30-page report was done. Um, so just backing up a tiny bit, um, when, the, when, when we were talking about climate change and that they wanted to go forward, we did find money. So the funding through um, this partnership fund through um, uh, uh, NEA, NEIHR uh, was enough to get sort of some of the early engagements going, uh, but BC First Nations Health Authority came through with funding to fund um, much of the rest of the project, which included uh, the video and some of the story maps. So what I would like to do, if it's possible, is click on this, uh, that, that live action. I hope the room is dark enough that you can 
Oh, okay. So, um, Tyler Tom, a, a student, was hired uh, through the summer. If I click on any of those little uh, orange dots, it brings up the photo that the student took and, and also the storyline behind that photo. So this is what it would look like. So here's the, here's the image. Um, I have no idea what this was. Um, Hannah Harry took this picture. Oh, this, I think, is the palm. Okay, so even the palm tree that is supposed to be uh, tropical can't find enough water. So, so there you are. Um, some of the other ones, maybe click on this one. Um, here's another. This is an example of what healthy environment might look like everywhere else, but everywhere else is just dry. So examples of some, some healthy areas, but examples of areas that were not, um, were not as healthy. So again, uh, photo voice was just really powerful tool for them to use in, uh, in, in their, uh, their contributions to this. So this now is the video I'd like to show, um, and we'll just see how this, this runs. When you go out there, and a lot of our teaching is you honor. It's very spiritual. You almost like asking for permission or apologizing if you're going to kill a deer. It's to feed your family. You know, we have different rituals, we have different teachings, you know, how to take care of that. When you go jigging for cod, before you set your line out there, you, in your mind, you apologize. I'm here to take only what I need. That's how important it was. It was almost sacred to our people. Growing up as a young teen, this is where we, this is where I learned I would follow around the elders, follow around the uncles. We would just, just come out and watch, experience. I wouldn't be hunting, just, just there to watch, there to learn. And then as time went on, it, they've ended up just handing out, you know, they give you a rifle and say, go to the island and go play, right? Go, go get a deer. Don't come back till you got one. And that's, that's kind of how we started. Uh, we take people on random tours, people that don't have the means to get out on the water and visit some of the traditional places and um, showing them ancient um, sites that our people used to frequent up and down the coast and ancient petroglyphs and all sorts of ancient stuff and yeah, just anything and everything. It's always something different every day. I just love being out on the water, in the bush, in the mountains. Oh, you got everything. There's medicines all over. I know everything about the, like you got oysters and clams, you got crabs, you got rock cod, ling cod, salmon, almost everything. All the staples our people eat. It's all around this island. We're doing a lot of studying. We're, we're surveying all of the territories. We're finding out what's here, uh, what needs to be protected. We're mapping so everybody knows where, where the resources are. It's the most detailed way of, of knowing, right? If you're on the ground and you see it day by day, you can actually have a, a better, uh, better understanding on how things are working, how things are going. The only way is to be out here, experience it. We remember kelp here. Like there was kelp right out from where I'm sitting tons of it um, and there was coho bait the herring could hide in it the coho would hide in it it would bring in you know there were abundance of whales and then when the herring were fished out in 1986 in 48 hours it's taken you know 30 years 27 years to get a decent fishery back so there is a light at the end of the tunnel but we need to take on these programs like plant kelp we need to bring back the eelgrass to our estuary, that's where the fry will hide when they come down the river. I think it'll it'll start. We just need that little kickstart, you know, to maybe help a, help it along, and you know, do whatever we can to help. It's worth it. It's worth saving all this. You know, the kelp, right? Kelp was major. Kelp was major for us because the fish herring would lay eggs on the kelp. Uh, kelp was used in steaming the clams 
you know, in, in old times, right? They would steam a ton of clams, then dry them out, store them dried. So now there's no, that the kelp's not around. It's tough to, tough to do that anymore. Um, we hope to remedy that and bring the coho back with the kelp would be nice too. The fish need water in September, right into November. With the, the warmer temperatures we've been having, the, the, we don't get rain until mid-October. Our Chinook are already waiting around, ripe in around the estuary to come in to spawn, and they're not making it in due to the predation we have with the sea lions. And then we do get all our water, we get it all after some of the fish had come up all at once, and then basically just decimate the survival rates in the river systems. Feels good having, yeah, just knowing you can get stuff off the land and knowing what to grab. And if you're stuck somewhere, you can go somewhere and get like a clam or an oyster or a berry or stinging nettles. <laughs> it's uh, super nu nutritive. It's got every vitamin mineral in it that you need to survive. They actually did a test where this guy went in the bush for three months and lived on nettle soup. We call it Sioux Sioux. And, and he was perfectly healthy, lost a bit of weight, had a slight green tinge, tinge on his skin, but he was perfectly healthy. And that was the test. It has every nutrition, it even has protein, so it's a good survival food. You know, the clams, the oysters, the mussels. Um, some places the barnacles are big enough to eat. The limpets, you know, that stick on there. The seaweeds, all the different seaweeds. We have plants on the, the foreshore, the sea asparagus, the sea plantain. Um, you get the, the docks, like the curly docks growing down there, that's really good medicines. Um, it's not just salmon. In general, last year when we had that big heat wave, the, we had our best tides, our low mean tides of one feet to, to, you know, to, to half a foot. And uh, the heat was just too much for a lot of our shellfish and our oysters and cockles, where they basically just come up to the surface and they died off. You could see the actual shells washing up on the shores on the high winds after we had uh, those uh, heat waves and uh, that's going to affect us tremendously. Oak over was, it was horrible. You could smell the death. Every, everyone on the coast talked about it. You could smell and just see it. You, the whole top layer of the beach was gone. It was basically cooked. <laughs> it was pretty awful. I'm worried, worried this, the, the climate change will affect everything, right? Like it, it already has. You get the massive die-offs of clams, the oysters. Uh, the heat really affects the animals here because there's only so much natural spring water in the middle of the island. And once that dries up, they have nothing. We actually had people in our community coming over here to feed the deer, to bring over apples and to bring over whatever they could to keep them going, which is amazing. Uh, but yeah, I'm just I'm worried about that. They, they're going to lose their, their food source, which will eventually kill off the island, right? That's, that's my biggest fear. Today we let go uh, about 42,000 adipose clipped coho into our lake. We let our fish go here for reasons why is to increase survival rates in the overall population of that species with the different temperatures that we've been encountering. Now we're starting to see it on the news so it's coming to light where we have atmospheric river rains and then we have all the flooding which in turn actually floods and so, uh, swells the river and wash and diluting out the eggs into the ocean and uh, uh, diluting the survival of the fish that are coming up the stream uh, in the salmon rearing beds. And then with all that we get the hot summers like we had last year uh, that basically uh, the water gets evaporated from our watersheds here and uh, the, the water goes dry in the creeks where we have overwintering coho here that have to make it out that spring and uh, they have no water to return to. Uh, when they return in the fall. So we basically are kind of hand-tied uh, with climate change. How do we deal with it? How do we adapt to it? How do we actually uh, develop tools to uh, strengthen our overall populations of fish with no water? Hello everyone, uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming and uh, listening to me. I'd like to thank Nier for, oh sorry, thank Nier for the funding and also for having me uh, here to talk today. Um, my talk, um, my name is Paul, Dr. Paul Hackett. Like Bob, I am a settler who is working at the University of Saskatchewan 
in, uh, um, uh, in Saskatoon, uh, coincidentally in the same department, which is Department of Geography and Planning. Unlike Bob, I'm from, beautiful, uh, from uh, Winterpeg or Winnipeg in Treaty 1 territory. Bob's from beautiful British Columbia. Uh, so I guess I got the short end of that stick. Um, uh, the talk today is about uh, a project that we've had ongoing, but we are entering a new phase in, and we're going to talk about uh, tuberculosis and the residential school system. And this isn't new, and for First Nations communities, these are not new stories. There's nothing new about it from day one. First Nations people, uh, parents, knew about the relationship between tuberculosis and their children that were sent to uh, schools. This is more perhaps intended to educate the public, to educate health professionals, to make them understand where we are and where we have come from. And one of the guiding philosophies of my research is that we cannot understand the past, or the present, pardon me, without understanding the past, and we can't make changes that will affect the future without understanding that past as well. So we're going to talk about the residential school system. We're, we're going to talk a little bit about tuberculosis and about the about the kind of research I want to do uh, and one particular part of that research. This particular question has become, unfortunately, perhaps a little bit too topical given the, the findings of uh, via ground penetrating radar of unmarked graves in residential schools across Canada. But more importantly in some respects is the response on social media by many people to deny that these existed, that these deaths existed. And I, part of what I want to do with this is to document what went on and to make it sure that people know that this absolutely did occur and that these deaths did occur and that we cannot deny that. So uh, a little bit of a look at our team. I'm the applicant. We have several great people working with us. One of them um, who, who is new to the, my group, DeAndre Smiles, is a professor at uh, University of Victoria. And he's great because he has an indigenous GIS lab with many indigenous uh, graduate students who are just uh, anxious to get going on our, this project uh, if we get the funding. I'd also like to point out the Office of the uh, Treaty Commissioner, as well as Lungs of Saskatchewan, who are important um, partners on this, Lung Saskatchewan because of data, but also because of the role that they have played in tuberculosis in this province uh, over a hundred years and their interest in reconciliation through uh, no, uh, knowledge um, gain. And the OTC especially because they are uh, partly a link to community, but also because one of our goals is to provide data for access to everybody, to the communities, to the people who are looking at their own history, their family history, and OTC has volunteered to sort of take on that role of being keeper of that data. So our goal is to provide OTC with that data as we collect it. Our goals as a, t as a whole are kind of threefold. Uh, one of them is archival investigation. We're, um, I come from geography, but I have a strong history background, and, and I've done a, a tremendous amount of archival research in the past. So a big part of this is going to be around archival research. A big part of that is going to be around the, the nature of nutrition in residential schools because it was a huge competitor, not only a uh, contributor, pardon me, not only to, uh, to diabetes, but also to tuberculosis. So these conditions that we want to document and document carefully and not simply suggest the stories, suggest the relationship, but we want to document them very well, we require a lot of archival investigation. A big part of this is going to be stories, and we were, we're hoping, again, through the, the guidance of OTC, to work with communities and community members to tell stories about residential school attendance, the conditions there, as well as, if people are w willing to, stories about tuberculosis. And we are trying to sort of put these together and, and create life stories for individuals to remove them from that sort of unknown history where no names are attached and it's simply a, a you know an anonymized situation but to bring for people's stories and i think that goes well with the idea of unmarked graves and and people who have no identity trying to find out who those people are trying to tell their stories i think is a big part of this the last one which i'm going to talk more about today is gis mapping so geographic information system or geographic information science and this goes back to what DeAndre is going to contribute to this project and his students will contribute to it, is basically about mapping. It's about smart mapping and putting things together in space. And I think that's a, a fairly novel contribution. So we will be looking, this is a map of, of, uh, of uh, residential schools across Canada. I've highlighted Saskatchewan as best I could there. I've got Brandon Residential School there for a good reason. Brandon Residential School was a 
school, oh, awesome, thank you, <laughs> that, uh, that uh, received students from all over Canada. And part of our, the scope of this project, part of the, our interest in this project is trying to understand that if sending kids to a residential school where they might be exposed to tuberculosis, were exposed to tuberculosis, sometimes died of tuberculosis in schools, might actually be a risk for their own homes, for their, their own communities. Because if we send a healthy kid off to, pardon me, off to a school uh, from northern Manitoba or for parts of Saskatchewan or for even southern Ontario, they come into contact with other people, they come into contact with the disease, and potentially they could bring that disease home. So our idea with this part of the research is to map where kids were and where they went to school and their sort of spatial patterns, if you will. Again, trained as a geographer, we tend to think about things in space. We will work with Saskatchewan, but the idea applies uh, overall. These are uh, copies of an entrance, exam or an entrance, entrance examination for residential school. We've used them in the past. We did a study a few years ago uh, with uh, Dr. Roland Dick, Dr. Sylvia Avigny, about um, body mass index of kids entering residential schools, trying to figure out if they were nutritionally healthy, just based on the data we could call from here. It's not perfect. But what we found was that those kids entering residential school were healthy nutritionally, and when we s consulted their, uh, their height for age and other figures, we found that they were entering school healthy, but we know that they didn't leave school healthy. So the, the implication is that what went on in the schools was bringing their, dragging their health down. That creates a perfect environment for um, poor nutrition, but also for tuberculosis and other diseases. Um, redacted all the pers uh, per uh, pertinent or identifiable information, but there's a fair amount of information over there. Here, there's a, a section that looks at who the child is, the parents, where they come from, which is critically important because we want to map that. And then there's a section because this is really about tuberculosis and not wanting to send kids to school who had tuberculosis. There's a, a health examination component there on the on the right there. And that component was not always done. Children were not always uh, assessed by a professional or even by anyone indeed. What happened sometimes was the children were simply sent to that school and nothing was ever, there's no examination done. And there were children who had tuberculosis who were sent to schools and uh, potentially could expose others to that. There were employees of schools who had tuberculosis, children of employees of schools, principals, children who had tuberculosis and could expose others to it. So it's a rich environment potentially for tuberculosis. We want to kind of look at all the kids going to, we'll probably, we'll be working with one school with multiple communities if, we, if the communities are on board there, looking at what was going on with them and with the health within those schools. This is a database that we've created uh, we have many hundreds, if not thousands, of entries already, and basically it transcribes all of that information and puts it in a database where we can do searches and what have you. I should say, going back here very quickly, oftentimes this little section here will have important data about health of the students or what goes on. That's one of the sources we have for our research. Another one is the quarterly return, and the government being the government wanted you to, to provide evidence that that child was actually in your school before they would give you the money. So if you were a principal of a school, you would have to let them know how long those children were in that school, for what quarters, and what their status was, if you will, in terms of health in some cases. This, these are done quarterly, every three months. And children will be named here. We, we know, uh, have more information over here, the age and what have you. And sometimes in this corner, or this column right here, there'll be some very interesting sometimes very troubling information about their status. They might have been sent to a hospital, they might have been sent home. In some cases, they had tuberculosis and were simply sent back to their community to die. Or they would be sent to a hospital. Sometimes they were, um, were sent off to another residential school. Or sometimes they were s simply sick and could not attend school, but they were in, in, the, in resident in the school, but were not attending classes. And some of that information will appear in that column, which gives us a little bit of insight. Again, working on this, creating a database, so that eventually we can sort of track, it sounds bad, track children through the system, create those stories, provide that information for the communities and for the people especially, but also try to build up a picture of what was going on with kids within those schools um, and their exposures to tuberculosis. Uh, Matthew, who is my research coordinator and GIS guy and, and re everything basically helps write my grants, uh, came up with these maps. These are our preliminary maps. This one is of uh, Beauvel, Indian Residential School. 
to give us an idea, this is 1941 to 1951, thanks, uh, and gives you an idea of the, where the kids were coming, for that, were coming from for that period. And if you think of that as potentially vectors for tuberculosis transmission, I've worked in Manitoba more or during my earlier part of my career, and there were communities in northern Manitoba that were relatively free of tuberculosis that were sending their kids off to uh, a major school in some place like Norway House or Cross Lake or something like that, and their kids were becoming infected and coming home. And it was noted in the record that they shouldn't be doing this, they should not take kids from these schools because the risk of infection in those communities was too great. The return, risk of return with infection. The same may be true of this. So we're trying to build up a, a picture of the spatial dynamics, I guess, of potentially of tuberculosis, the contribution of those residential schools to the spread of the disease to communities that had previously had not known the disease. This one is of File Hills in the south. I say in the south, but if we take a look at where the kids are coming from, uh, they are coming from fairly far north. And there we go, thank you. Well, there's Mr. Wasis there. Uh, uh, where I've been working in, there's Prince Albert up there. They're coming from a, a great distance to the, this, this school. They're mixing with other kids from that area. They're potentially being exposed to uh, non-Indigenous people who have tuberculosis through attendance at the school. We know that they were. We know that the kids were, in fact, from Bry uh, Peter Bryce's report, we know that they were dying in, in unconscionable numbers just because of their attendance at the schools. The problem may, or the further problem may be that they are bringing that disease potentially back to their communities and exposing their uh, fellow uh, community members. Anyway, I'd like to thank you. Uh, this is the project. We are, uh, right now we're in the stage where we've just applied, we're just applying for the grant. Um, year one is going to be us trying to find communities who might be in, want to engage with this, individuals who might want to engage with this and tell those kinds of stories. And I know that that's a, a difficult proposition to tell and talk about these kinds of issues and to talk about particularly tuberculosis in your family or even the, in your own history, but we're hoping that some people will step forward and, and help us with that. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks. I guess I'm shorter. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, MRI and uh, MRI for Northern uh, Community Clinics, ostensibly. Um, so this is a uh, prototype uh, MRI on the desk here. I'm going to I'm going to lift the lid off at the end, kind of a little bit of a, a dramatic reveal at the end. So uh, the objective of what I've been working on is to put MRI into space. And so I currently am actually working on a, a contract with the Canadian Space Agency to define uh, risk size MRI for the Lunar Gateway. So the Lunar Gateway is, is, uh, is a space station that's planned for the end of the decade to orbit the moon. And the idea is uh, to put an MRI on that uh, so we can look at muscle and bone and astronauts and see how um, deep space radiation affects muscle and bone and astronauts because uh, astronauts in, in, in the International Space Station, for example, are kind of protected from that. They're not far enough from Earth. Um, so this is a prototype of, of, of that particular uh, design. And in this picture, you can also see a community clinic. This is in Fox Lake in northern Alberta. Uh, and I got to go there for a day to see uh, what was happening there. Um, because the Canadian Space Agency has started a program, they call it uh, Health Beyond, where um, uh, technology developed for space is uh, adapted to use on Earth. So uh, I wanted to say a little bit about uh, my background since uh, er uh, everybody does. So my ancestors uh, uh, were um, brought over in the 1750s uh, to Nova Scotia. Uh, they were Huguenots uh, fleeing religious persecution. So my ancestors have been in this, on this land uh, since before there was a Canada. Uh, I don't know what my DNA is because I haven't uh, got it officially examined. I probably never will. My daughter says I'm culturally ambiguous, uh, but my my uh, culture is Canadian, and it is uh, my great hope that the work of the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission uh, will change what that means to be a Canadian. So uh, just to tell just a little bit, a couple of slides to show what this gateway is, is supposed to be. It's a space station. It's supposed to orbit the moon in an orbit that looks like this. Uh, here's another view. 
uh, showing kind of the relative uh, or the, the orbit relative to the Earth. It's, it's, it's way out there in space. So this is what I mentioned, the Canadian Space Agency's Health Beyond Initiative and uh, why I'm here at all, really, um, because my primary interest was to put uh, stuff into space. Uh, but um, I'm very excited to now be a part of, of this. And I'm just going to read here what it says uh, in the Space Agency's own, word, our own words. Our objective is to stimulate and support innovative and sustainable solutions that will address the healthcare challenges faced by astronauts in deep space and people living in remote communities across Canada. This means that through Health Beyond, the Canadian Space Agency is working with experts and groups across Canada as well as international partners. Together we are identifying and developing innovative medical technologies uh, and approaches to remote healthcare delivery. These solutions will support astronauts during future missions to the moon and Mars, and they will also benefit Canadians, particularly those in communities that do not have easy access to he extended healthcare. And so from uh, uh, all of uh, what's been said here today, that, that's very surfacey stuff. Uh, but the idea is um, uh, the conditions that uh, people in remote communities have to deal with are, are similar to the conditions that we uh, expect that people uh, eventually living in space and on the moon and on Mars will have to live with. And uh, interestingly, le yesterday I saw a presentation uh, by a fellow who uh, lives in um, a remote community in Ontario. Um, you know, thinking he could never be uh, involved in the space uh, industry or space effort, and, and he is very deeply. And uh, one thing that he said that struck me was that um, the way that people live in small communities uh, is how, it is, is, is the sort of thing that will be needed uh, when people go and live on the moon, because people living on the moon are going to be in small communities, and so they're going to have to you know, relate to each other and, and, and work with each other and, you know, live off of whatever resources they happen to have locally. So, um, uh, I th this, this is a real thing. Um, so what I'm doing here is, uh, well, actually I'll just give you some background of, um, of how I came here uh, with the space work. So I originally proposed that uh, we do a whole body size on the space station uh, back in 2012. Um, this, is, this is a crazy idea, uh, space agency people said, no, you can't take up that much space on the space station, Canada doesn't have that much access. So we downsized it to a wrist size and uh, they said, okay, that'll work. And so we got a study and, and we defined uh, wrist size MRI. None of these, none of these have been built. Uh, later they said, okay, wrist size is fine, but what we really want to do is look at the leg or the ankle or something. <coughs> so why don't you uh, upgrade that to a larger design? So we did. And then I uh, got some funding and uh, uh, I had a bunch of graduate students for five or six years and we worked on this uh, zero gravity space flight and we, we actually built kind of a prototype of this ankle size, this, this leg size MRI and flew it in zero gravity on a jet out of uh, Ottawa on one of NRC's jets, it's Vulcan 20 jet. Uh, okay, so why, why we wanna do this um, and so for space and, and for northern, northern communities. So the development of small uh, scale MRI like this uh, is kind of a worldwide effort. Um, not the only one working on that idea. I am the only one working on the particular technology that's in this box here. Uh, so the idea is MRI is very expensive uh, medical imaging modality. Uh, it's not accessible um, really. Uh, by people in large urban centers, much less by um, most of humanity who uh, doesn't live near these uh, wealthy um, centers. So, uh, but nevertheless, um, uh, we have a couple of, of points here. So one is this, this is nothing like the MRI in the hospital, right? Like, look at it, come on. So uh, it's a device, it is an MRI, but it's a medical device for which we don't really know what it's useful for. And so that's, that's where near and all this comes in, is um, you, basically communities need to tell us what the problems are and then we have to think, can this device help out in any way? So that's, that's one aspect of it. Um, and, and this point number two is this, this message applies to both space and in, in uh, northern communities. So in space, 
Uh, what do we use it for? We're using it actually for research to try and understand uh, what damage the human body uh, uh, sustains uh, when you're in space for a long time and how to, um, how to um, alleviate that. So uh, that's, that's what we want to use. So let's just see. So though I just kind of basically covered those points uh, that are in the blocks here. So the, in, in space, the goal is to arrive at Mars alive eventually. And it, for northern communities, a couple of ideas, maybe evaluate head trauma, maybe image broken bones, even though x-ray can do it, uh, MRI might be a better way. Another idea that I heard recently was frostbite. Uh, so how, this is, this is where we're gonna uh, be looking for funding to do this. Uh, with healthcare, uh, uh, point number one is basically um, have the communities tell us uh, what they need and then see if, if we have anything that we can offer. Um, and then, the, but the other point is technology development. So I'm currently working with SIIT. Uh, I, I just met Lawrence here and, and actually I don't know your last name even yet, but we're, we're scheming and uh, we're gonna actually get together next Tuesday with a couple of students with the idea we're gonna build these things, students are gonna build these things, the, the construction of them is very simple. And the idea that, the, the ideas that um, I'm expecting from students to improve the design, I'm very, very excited to, to work with, with uh, SIIT on this, this sort of thing. So uh, that's what we're doing. Um, and then of course, uh, students gain from it by um, you know, learning trade skills, technical skills for doing it. And it's a fun project and just to get more and more people interested in, in what we're doing. So this last slide, so um, this shows three MRIs. I call them owl MRIs. I name, name my MRIs after birds. Uh, this one in the box is the first one. The second one is currently in Toronto. It produced these, these images of these arms. Okay. <laughs> We're competing. So uh, it was, uh, these are images through your arm. So you can see the non radius bones here. You can see the skin uh, around. You can see the muscle inside. And on the bone, you can see the dark thing around. Uh, the, the marrow is the white, and the dark thing around it's the cortex of the bone. Uh, these are, there's some geometrical distortion. I mean, this, this technology is not ready for the clinic yet. Uh, so. Uh, a lot of effort will be put into the kind of educational, technical uh, development uh, uh, thing that I showed on the other slide. So uh, at the end, I'm going to do a little technical reveal. I'm going to take out my screwdriver. I'm going to take out, take out the box, uh, take the box off and just let you see this thing in real life. Manto Walter, you better put your shit together. Space is getting MRI report in Northern Saskatchewan. <laughs> That's probably going to be true. <laughs> Actually, small ones like this, uh, yes, but um, we hope to get uh, MRIs. Uh, there's bigger ones that are between this size and, and the ones you see in the hospital with. Can we use for that sort of thing? So is this dramatic enough? Why can you take screws out of a box? What's it going to look like? Will it look like that picture? So this thing weighs 26 pounds. Okay, so the one in the hospital weighs 3 tons or 30 tons. A lot. your arm in there. Yeah, so this is the idea is uh, the arm goes in here and this will produce an image of a uh, slice of the arm. So it's very specialized for this uh, space station use where it just produces that one image. <laughs> what we see out there. So anyway, uh, here it is. Um, maybe come up afterwards if there's opportunity and get a closer look. And thank you. Great, I get to follow the Canada Space Agency and an MRI. That's almost the size of an Apple app. So I'll, I'll try my best. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. 
My name is Walter Smith. I'm from Pine House Lake. I'm currently employed by Kinepic Métis Local 9. I'm an, an indigenous rights-bearing nation located in Pine House. Before I start, I want to recognize some Pine House community members in attendance. Terry Hansen Gardner and uh, Krista Natamogan. And I also want to recognize Charlotte Ross, who is a sister to my wife, Lori. I am an indigenous person born and living around Pine House Lake. I'm a card-carrying First Nations member of the Lac La Ronge Indian Band, a right I received from my mother through Bill C-3 and the Gender Equity and in Indian Registration Act. I'm also a Kinepic Métis from Pine House on my father's side. Currently, I can only subscribe to one indigenous identity. My indigenous education stems from my relationships with indigenous people my entire life. I am moderately fluent in Cree speaking, having to learn the language twice. I was part of the 60s school process in which I lost my language and my culture. I am grateful for the generosity of indigenous people, namely my community, my family, and my marriage into a strong indigenous family. I have successfully regained my indigenous identity, a strengthening process that must be allowed for so many more survivors. I am fully capable of living on the land traditionally, and I'm grateful I was able to regain the knowledge of the Woodland Cree. My Western education stems from three university degrees, two masters and one undergrad, a certificate in chem technology and a red seal in journeyman ticket in construction craft. I am privileged to be able to live a blended culture and I'm living a storied life. What is consultation and engagement and why is it important? I wanted to uh, quote Chief Cadmus Delorme or the ex-Chief Cadmus Delorme. We must all put down our ignorance and accidental racism of not addressing the truth that this country, Canada, has with indigenous people. Delorme said in response to the find, we're not asking for pity, we're asking for understanding. We can't control other people's actions, and we can't control a system that's outdated. But we can control our thoughts, and we can control our own actions. This statement was very helpful to me. It let me be less angry, and I'm very grateful for hearing those words. We live in a reality that seems that indigenous people, our leaders, have to be twice as good. Our elders, well, they're demanding that we're fluent in our languages, authentic as indigenous people in our communities, with our cultures intact. We must understand academic ways of knowing through our credentials, education, degrees, to be considered equals in Western society. It's a burden you feel. For many indigenous people, this dual existence is not preferred or possible. Pine House is in the traditional territory of the Kinepic Métis local. It is the center of our world and way of life. Kinepic and Pine House completed in partnerships with industry our occupational land use mapping area. We mapped 38,572 features representing 60 different land use activities over an 11,000 square kilometer range around Pine House. We digitally mapped and proved that we use this land for food, for medicine, for wellness, and materials, and that we've done so since time immemorial. Our research proved our constitutionally protected Section 35 rights. We, while we still have yet to complete this process for all the area where we practice our traditional harvesting activities, we've proven that the land is central to how we identify as a people. We believe this is true for all indigenous communities and the land around their communities. Another reality, these are some pictures of tougher places in Pine House. 
We're making up for lost time. We did not choose to be undereducated in Western ways. We did not choose to be indigenous, nor did we choose the land on which we live. It was where we were created, a place just for us. We educated ourselves to live in balance with the bounty and the beauty of that which was around us. And it was beautiful. It was always our home. Northern Saskatchewan is Canada's second poorest region economically, as verified by the Conference Board of Canada. We have a young population with 50% under 29. We can utilize all this youthful energy to create value for our communities, for our society. Or we can maintain the status quo of overrepresentation in health and justice statistics. Either way, we will all pay. When one considers that the development of uranium mining operations happened to us in Pine House 50 years ago, on our territories, we didn't move anywhere. We didn't go to it. Industry came to us. We were unprepared for this development and the impact it would have on our culture, our language, and our community. 50 years later, we're still not ready. We need to do better. We ask, what is the threshold for Western education that's required for an indigenous community such as Pine House, which has proven the most impacted by these operations to fully understand and participate in modern uranium mining operations while maintaining an indigenous identity? Despite biblical historical challenges, we're amazed as a community at how much we've accomplished in preserving our language and culture. We're also impressed at how well we're doing economically. We credit this success to partnerships with government, with industry, and with academia, supported by a robust internal communication process in our community and a strong leadership we expect to grow with our partnerships and in time with a new, renewed interest and in reconciliation because we will not passively watch activity occurring on our territories. And we will work with intention and we will build capacity. We understand that partnerships written with stated objectives and outcomes with realistic timelines allow indigenous communities to make plans to continue and improve. There was a time when many people in Pine House were unable to fish or hunt without a license or be punished for speaking Cree or not to be hired at a mine because their English wasn't good enough. <coughs> There's so many other stories that cause damage and yet no monetary processes to rectify that damage. Our youngest fluent Cree speaker and this is an important distinction. Our youngest fluent Cree thinking and Cree speaking is 40 years old. You can draw conclusions on where this lack of transference will lead. The Kinepic Metis local engagement is an organic process meaning we develop our understanding and capacity at the speed our community can absorb this new information while we're still rebuilding our indigenous identity. We engage with each other first so that we can understand where we are currently. We host weekly prevention meetings to discuss our community issues, and these meetings is permanently scheduled 9.30 Monday morning. We invite people to come and visit and watch us. The average attendance is about 40 people. We host monthly Reclaiming Our Community meetings to work towards a longer term solutions for our issues. Again, permanently scheduled 9.30 on the first Thursday of each month with an average attendance of 80 people. We digitized our current land use and occupational map area the left shows our mapped area 
and the right shows the overlay with mineral dispositions. We use this land to offset the effects of colonization and institutional racism. We use this land to maintain our identity as a people. We use this land to live as we always have. We want to continue to live this way. Our future will be built on partnerships with similar modern conveniences appreciated by Western communities. We monitor mineral dispositions in real time as they have grown every month at a significant cost to our community. We ask, I wonder who's responsible for this process? While it has had a significant positive impact, we could have focused our time and energy on growing our social development needs, yet we're expected to do both with limited resources and capacity. Our most significant games with industry and agencies are through formalized partnership agreements. Our indigenous nation signed a collaboration agreement with Cameco and Orano in 2012. We also signed an exploration agreement with Denison Mines at the 2022 Elders Gathering. We are currently in negotiations with a new collaboration agreement with Denison, and we're in talks with many exploration companies for several projects. These agreements support our community in meeting basic needs such as housing, homelessness, managing addiction treatment, and supporting our elders, students, and youth recreation. In parallel, we're building industrial and commercial capacity in a braided model. We've created community-owned corporations such as Pine House Business North and the Pine House Housing Corporation. Through this, we work extensively with our locally owned co-op and we're also building an indigenous governance model through Kanipik Métis Local. We use these resources to promote our woodland indigenous culture, including development of our cultural calendar, where we use our language and our culture throughout the year. And it states all of the activities we do in a 12 month cycle. As stated previously, as a community, we need to be twice as good. It is necessary we work diligently to preserve who we are and who we have always been. Consider the need for a culture and language preservation for a small nation like the people of Kinepik and Pine House. We must be capable enough to understand federal, provincial, and academic policies to complete complicated applications for programs and requirements for businesses. Yet, we must persevere if we want to continue as identifying as indigenous. Our new focus is for resources and ideas to develop STEM education in Pine House. We'll require new resources. We must do this if we will ever have the material capacity to overcome the legacy that colonization, academia, and industry have imprinted on our community. We look forward to our future as we reclaim our community and identity. We look forward to increasing partnerships and developing a STEM, leg a STEM legacy that we can all be proud of. We're grateful and we welcome visitors to come and see with their own eyes what we do with any profits. We build homes for people who would previously could not dream of owning one. We built an arena facility so our children can dream about the NHL or maybe the Olympics. We built an elders complex so our most vulnerable feel safe in a modern facility. We're developing training programs and cultural activities that are hosted and practiced annually. We have a long way to go to reach a blended Western standard, but we will continue to develop organically and authentically. We will create a STEM culture, for we must Therefore, we will. In an askumutin, I am thankful and I'm grateful. Piwasi squan. A better day is coming. And akamiamuk. Persevere. 
and never stop to improve. Thank you.